Hi everybody, welcome to Right to the Top, I'm Adam. In today's video, I want to talk to you about a very important topic and a very misunderstood topic. We're going to talk about high-end vocabulary. Now, I often tell people, if you want to increase your LR score in the IELTS, for example, your lexical resource score, or in the TOEFL or any other exam, you need more high-end vocabulary. Now, a lot of people misunderstand this high-end vocabulary to mean big words, many syllables, complicated spelling, very academic words or very technical words. That is not the case. In fact, what I, I'm going to show you today, I'm going to give you seven or I'm going to give you eight words, seven or eight, that are actually one syllable. They're short words, very easy to say, easy to spell in most cases. A couple of them might be a bit tricky. But seven one-syllable words that are actually high-end, that are not used very commonly, but are actually everyday words. Native speakers do use them quite regularly. If you read newspapers, if you watch TV news, you'll actually hear these words as well. And, but before I do that, I want to show you a little bit what not to do. Okay? I want to show you a few words. These are words that some people love to use in the IELTS or TOEFL essay because they think it will actually raise their score. In most cases, these words are actually going to hurt your score. One, these are not everyday words. These are very like SAT or GMAT level vocabulary. People don't really use them very often. Even in university, when you do use these words, they're a little bit for style, but a little bit for show. Professors don't necessarily like them very much either. And the main reason I tell you not to use these words is because, one, the graders will know that you memorized them. These are not words that people just know, the words that are memorized. B, you'll probably misspell all or most of these words. They're not easy words to spell. And three, you'll, you, you might not know how to use them in context 100%. Okay? A lot of people think they know the meanings, which they may know, but they don't know the context. So for example, plethora. Instead of plethora, just use the word many. Plethora means many. Plethora is too fancy. You're trying to impress. You're not impressing. Use many, it's much easier. Myriad. A lot of people don't realize that myriad means many. A lot of people think that myriad means variety. Myriad means many or countless. So you're talking about a lot of things. And usually when people use myriad about something, that something does not usually, we don't usually describe it as countless, like uh, unlimited number, a lot, a lot. Just use many, you're much safer. Alleviate. Alleviate means reduce or diminish, but you can't use alleviate any time that you would use reduce. For example, you cannot alleviate numbers. You cannot alleviate the number of staff members who are going to get fired. You alleviate means you reduce something negative and something that's uncountable, like, a, con like a, um, a concept. You can alleviate pain. You can alleviate suffering. You can even alleviate traffic congestion. But you can't alleviate anything good, and you can't alleviate numbers. And a lot of people use alleviate any time they would use reduce, and it doesn't always work. Plus, very easy to misspell. Amalgamate is a very specific word for a very specific situation. When you join things to make one thing, you can use amalgamate. But even then, better to use join or fuse. The only time we really use amalgamate is when we're talking about chemical processes or in like uh, chemistry or even in physics when you're joining two elements to make a, a new one single element. Or in business, when companies amalgamate means they take all their small companies they join them into one conglomerate. But again, if you're not 100% sure how to use the word, better just not to use it. Now, these two words are actually very good words, but as you see them right here, these are a problem. Conductive does not mean to help something uh, work or to help something get along to somewhere else. Conductive means something that transfers, transfers heat or electricity well. Renumeration is actually not a word. What, you, what people who try to use these words are trying to use are actually conducive. Notice the T here. Notice there's no T in the next one. 
conducive means it helps something happen. And remuneration means like a salary or payment, not remuneration. Very easy to mix these two. If you're not 100% sure, don't use them. The graders will know you memorize them. They'll know you're trying hard to use these words. It will work against your score. So I'm going to give you seven easy to remember words, generally easy to spell words. Just be careful with gauge and rain. They can be a little bit confusing in terms of spelling. And these are words that are, again, native speakers use them all the time. You'll hear them on the news. You'll read them in newspapers all the time. They're actually quite simple, but a lot of context that you can actually use them in. So let's start. What does court mean? To court. To court someone or something means to try to attract, to seduce, or to tempt something or someone to do something, to join something, to go somewhere. It could also mean to invite. Now, to invite doesn't mean like to invite to a party. It means to invite a situation into your life, right? So almost like a risk-reward kind of invitation to something, or to just try to achieve some sort of result. Now, if you want to use the noun form, use courtship or courting, and I'll explain that in the last sample. So again, the best way to understand words is to see them in action, right? So in the US, college sports is a multi-billion dollar industry. So all the sports together is one industry, makes it multi-billions. Everybody thinks it's amateurs, it's actually a big business. That is why college teams often send scouts, scouts are professionals who look for talent, to high schools all over the country to court the top players. So in a high school, there's a player who's really very good. He's tall, he's seven feet tall, amazing basketball player. All the top colleges want this player to come play for their team. So they will go there, they will offer scholarships, they will offer opportunities and endorsements and commercials. All of this to try to attract that player to their school. Now, all kinds of schools are doing it. A lot of colleges are competing. All of them are offering something to try to court the student to their school, to try to attract them, him or her. Anyone who opens a business without researching the market, the location, and the competition is courting failure, is basically inviting failure into the business, into the, into the, into the person's life. If you don't do the research, you're almost guaranteed to fail. So not doing the research is inviting the failure, is courting failure. And again, you could say inviting or is risking failure or is probably going to end up in failure, all these things. But again, court or to court is a very good word, easy to remember, generally easy to spell, will get you higher points. Because this word, if you use it correctly, doesn't look like you memorized it. It looks like you actually know how to use it. The big words, stand out and I, the greater knows you memorized. Now, 100 years ago, courting rituals or courtship rituals included bringing a girl flowers and asking her to the movies. Today, relationships are conducted via text and flower emojis. So they don't bring flowers anymore, they send a flower emoji over the phone. So the courtship rituals, the way a man tries to attract a woman or vice versa, has changed over the last 100 years, right? So you're trying to achieve a relationship, you're trying to attract someone, invite them into your life, all of these things, courtship. That's where the word comes from. In the old days of kings and queens, there was a court of the palace or the mansion or whatever, and all the nobles were gathered there and they would, all the young people would try to match up. That's where the whole courtship idea comes from. Sway, sway could be a noun or a verb. As a noun, it means the influence you have over somebody or the power or the rule you have. So especially governments have sway or have power over colonies or other countries. To, and you, we often use uh, have sway or hold sway over someone or something. As a verb, it means to influence or to bend to one's will. So if you think of a tree, a tree is standing there, but when the wind comes or the breeze, the, the tree sways back and forth. That's what the actual action of the verb means, bend, right? So when you sway someone, you bend them 
to do what you want them to do, to your will. Even though it may seem that politicians do mostly what lobbyists and donors ask of them, the voting public does hold sway over these officials. So the voting public does have some power over these politicians, since they can fire them and hire them through the ballot box. They can vote them out of office, vote them into office. That being said, an experienced politician knows how to sway his electorate. The politician knows how to bend the opinion, the feelings of the people voting using the media and the money that his donors give him or her. Okay, So that is sway. Again, everyday word, but hardly ever used on the IELTS and TOEFL. You can really impress the graders by knowing these types of words that are you know, short, one syllable, small, easy to spell, but very powerful words, very high-end vocabulary. And this is what I mean by high-end. Not big, useful, very contextual words. Next, we have gauge. Now, don't let the spelling fool you. The, sp the pronunciation, pronunciation is gauge. Just imagine the U is not there. Again, noun or verb. The noun, you're not going to use so much. The noun is an actual tool that you use to measure something. A speed gauge, a depth gauge, a height gauge that you use to measure speed, depth, or height. But to gauge means to measure. You can measure something like the actual numbers. But it's also to get a sense of something. So that's where you're going to use it more. Instead of using measure or instead of using the word understand, you can try to gauge something. You can try to gauge a situation, gauge a mindset, etc. A good teacher will gauge his student's comprehension of the class material before uh, having them sit for a formal test. So if I'm a teacher, if I, I'm, I think, OK, next week I need to give the students a test. But first, if I think they're all going to fail, then there's no point giving them the test. I don't want my students to fail. So I need to gauge, try to get an understanding of, do they understand the material? If yes, give them the test. Everybody does well. If no, review a little bit more, and then give them the test. The consumer price index, so that's more like an education topic for an essay. Let's talk about economics or business topics for an essay. The consumer price index, or it's called a CPI, is a tool that uses basket of daily consumer goods and services to gauge the rise in prices. So here we're actually measuring numbers. How much did prices rise? So it includes things like bread and milk and eggs and uh, cleaning service and gas and car wash and very basic everyday consumer items and services. How much do they all add up to in this little basket of things, let's say 30 items and services? If one month they cost $2,000 or let's say $200, the next month it costs $205, that means prices are going up. That means inflation is uh, happening and have to be careful about fiscal policy. The government needs to be careful how they change their money policies. Fiscal, money, right? So again, a lot of these words I'm giving you pay also attention to the context. You can have very, a lot of different topics for uh, essays that you're going to need to write. Use these words, start building up your, vo your vocabulary base, your idea bank. Think of where you can use all of these different uh, words. So next one, flock. Now, this is a very good word. Everyday word, people think about flock, they think about birds, but you can use this about people. You can talk about tourism, you can talk about shopping, you can talk about all kinds of things. Flock means to come together in large numbers or to go somewhere in great numbers. And with, when I talk about great numbers, I talk, I'm talking about people, a great number of people, or a certain type of person when we're talking about the noun use. The noun is a, a group of people of the same type. So Canadians are well known in Florida as snowbirds. Since so many of them flock to the warm beach towns, so flock, that means a lot of them, a lot of Canadians in great numbers go to these warm beach towns during the cold Canadian winters. That's why they call them snowbirds. They fly down to Florida. Many stores hire extra security guards during the sales season 
to try to control the greedy flocks of shoppers looking for bargains. Flocks means big groups of shoppers, but they're a very specific type of shopper. They're just looking for bargains, and they're willing to beat each other up like you, sometimes you see on the news Black Friday, people getting into fights over a TV. That's a type of shopper. They flock together to these stores. Next, site. This is a very useful word in everyday use, but also in academics. If you're going to university, you must know this word. To cite, the noun is a citation. When you cite, you're referring to something, like you're referring to a study that's been published or research or an expert who said something. So anytime you're taking information that somebody else has already published or expressed, you must say that you got this information from there or from that person, okay? So people often cite the Constitution when making political arguments, though it is not always clear that they have actually read this document, okay? People talk about the Constitution all the time, doesn't mean they actually know that the Constitution says this or doesn't say it. And this is very important. Again, if you're going to university, a university can expel a student who does not properly cite data taken from published sources. So if you write a paper and you use material or data or quotations or anything from something that's already been published and you don't include a citation, you don't say where you found this, when that thing was published, why you're using it, in a bibliography, that would be called, then you can, the, not only will you fail the project, they can actually kick you out of university. It's illegal to copy other people's information, okay? It's called plagiarism. You're breaking copyright laws. You can get kicked out of school. A couple more. Rain. Sounds like the rain that falls from the sky, but be careful. It's R-E-I-N, not R-A-I-N. To, as a verb, it means to control or restrain somebody or something, to hold back. As a noun, it just basically means the controls, the things you, you're using to control somebody or to restrain somebody or, or something. So it is up to parents to rein their children when the latter spend too much time on social media. If, a child, if your child is on social media too much, it's up to you to control how much time they spend. You have to rein them your child reigns their usage of their uh, phone, tablet, whatever. If governments do not rein in the amount of waste produced, they can't blame others for polluting, just like they do, right? If they do, do not rein in, if they do, do not control or reduce or somehow restrain waste from getting worse and worse, they can't say to anybody else, oh, you're polluting too much, right? That's uh, hypocritical. Most governments are weak because no one has the courage to take the reins. So take the reins is actually an idiom. It basically means take control. Now, if you think about a horse, a horse has like the, you know, the, the straps and the metal on its mouth and the thing that the rider can pull back. Those are called reins. So when you take the reins, it means you're taking control of the horse. But you can take control of any situation, including politics, business, anything else like that. Take the reins, very good idiom. You can use it in your essays, in your academic essays. And last but not least, tweak. You may have heard this word. I've, I like to use this word myself a lot. To tweak means to make small changes to something to make it better or more efficient. A tweak is the noun, is the change that you've made. So if you find that job interviewers are not calling you back for second meetings, Try tweaking your presentation a little to stand out from other candidates. Make some changes to your presentation so that you stand out and are more memorable to the interviewers. By making just a few small tweaks, a few small changes to a car's engine, a person can get an extra 10 miles per gallon per tank of gas and make it more efficient, reduce the carbon footprint. So just make some changes, and those changes will make the car run more smoothly. And that's it, so there you go, seven words, a few words to avoid using because the graders will see right through it and it'll make your writing much smoother not to use those but to use these uh, shorter but more effective words. And that's it, start building your uh, vocabulary bank, start building your idea bank, get more of these simple words but effective words 
And uh, of course, you can ask each other questions on YouTube comment section. Hopefully, try out some of these words and sentences. If you, have a, if you like this video, please give me a like. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And come back. I'll make more videos like this about vocab, about grammar, writing, etc. Okay? See you again soon. Bye-bye.